All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Um, thank you for your graciousness to us. Um, the idea that you have created a way where you look at us not as we are in our sin, but rather as we are in Christ. Um, that you've made a particular way where Christ's righteousness can become our righteousness and that you can uh, transform us into men and women of whom the cosmos is not worthy. Father, uh, we thank you for that. And we thank you how you have revealed yourself perfectly in your word and uh, so many uh, voices today, uh, even those who proclaim to be Christian voices, uh, seem to have nothing but accusation against your word and uh, fault finding. And I pray, uh, I pray that you help us see the beauty of your word. Um, I pray that you help us think your thoughts after you. Um, and I pray that you do it in a way that will drive us out of boasting in ourselves and self-righteousness and self-confidence, but rather a supreme confidence in uh, what Christ has done and what he has promised to do in us. I pray that the power of your word would impact our lives today. And we make this prayer not claiming any inherent superiority over anyone else or any uh, inherent freedom from sins that have plagued other people, but rather we make this prayer because our Lord Jesus has lived the perfect life in our behalf, has died for our sins, and has promised our total transformation one day in heaven with you. And so we ask that you bless us today with the blessing that he has earned for us, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Carl. All right. Uh, so uh, we're looking today at uh, an overview in Matthew, and, and we do have a lot we're going to look at, so I think um, we'll just look a little bit at it. Um, we're going to look at this statement, the virgin will conceive and bear a son. And you may or may not know, but there's debate over that. Um, does it really say the virgin? Is it a virgin? Or is it even a young girl? Um, so what's uh, going on there? Um, how did the Magi know to follow a star? The Magi are apparently astronomers, and the only connection uh, with astronomers and with this word Magi is when Daniel was uh, in Babylon 500 years before uh, uh, Christ was born. So why in the world would 500 years later uh, people in that group be looking for a star? Uh, what had they read in the Bible? And uh, 500 years seems a long time. Aren't there problems in the genealogies? And so often people will point out whether well, genealogies in Matthew and Luke don't agree, and that's true, they don't agree. Um, and so what, what do we do about that? Is it a mistake uh, in the Bible? Why is uh, Matthew writing his book in five sections? Uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but Matthew divides... Uh, his book, not by chapter numbers. Those were put in in the Middle Ages. The joke is the guy who did it was riding on a horse, and whenever the horse stumbled, that's where he put the chapter breaks. Sometimes that seems true, uh, almost. Uh, but when Matthew divided his book, he divided it into five sections. Why? Why did he do that? Um, we're going to see Jesus as the super Moses that... Uh, Matthew is presenting Jesus as the super Moses in Matthew. And we're going to look at um, a thing that would totally make sense to Jews, but is completely foreign to us. And it's a thing called a toledoth, 
related uh, to a word about a woman having a baby. And uh, believe it or not, the Bible is actually divided up into 14 toledos. Uh, Ten of them are in um, uh, Genesis. The remaining three are in the Old Testament, and one uh, starts the book of Matthew. So what in the world is this toledoth, and why did God divide the um, Bible up into toledoth? And doesn't Matthew misquote Scripture? Um, I mean, uh, as the scriptures say, he will be called a Nazarene. And like, you go through every single verse in the Old Testament, and like, there's no verse that says he will be called a Nazarene. And yet, Matthew is saying, no, the scriptures do say. And uh, I can just say this uh, um, as a person who has been blessed by God to spend about 40 years in the original languages of Scripture, um, I can tell you this, that none of those caused me any qualm of conscience. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of giddy about being able to look at these because these were all uh, problems against the Bible that people have raised over the years that actually have really, really, really good um, uh, solutions. And not just solutions, like maybe that's the case, but like, oh my goodness, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I would just encourage you, um, you know, if if you're in a place and people are encouraging you not to believe, like, if your pastor is like this person who's helping you to doubt, go to a different church. Go to someone who will help you believe the Bible, not who will help you uh, stumble. Um, and there are great churches like that out there, people who uh, will help you who, like Paul, the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to reliable men who will teach others also. That's the kind of person you want uh, to look for to uh, help. Um, and that's what uh, I want to do for us uh, today. I um, want to give you the benefit of um, these 40 pleasurable years that God has given me in the original languages, and I hope that I can help all of us see some of the these cool things uh, in that God's placed in His uh, Word. So, uh, since we have a lot of material and um, we don't have a whole lot of time, uh, let's just uh, jump right in. So, how many of you knew that Matthew was divided into five sections? Very good. Um, well, Matthew is divided into five sections. Um, in English, it kind of works uh, like this. When Jesus finished these sayings, when Jesus finished instructing his, his 12 disciples, when Jesus finished these parables, when Jesus finished these sayings, when Jesus finished all these sayings, and you look at that and you say, well, that is kind of... Uh, you know, interesting, but I'm not really seeing that that's, you know, Matthew dividing. Well, let's look at it, at it in Greek. Does it look like in Greek that it's uh, exactly the same, like Matthew's made five headings? Because those words, like, look exactly the same to me and in exactly the same order. When Matthew wrote his book, he wanted us to realize that the book his book, he's dividing it into five sections. Now, as an intelligent reader of God's Word, do you have a question when you hear uh, and you hear me making this uh, idea that Matthew is written in five sections? Do you have a question as an intelligent reader? Why? And here's my answer. It's absolutely meaningless. Uh, Matthew had no intent when he put this uh, um, thing because he didn't really see it. Oh, 
I see I'm not convincing you. Um, my feelings are hurt. No, not really. Uh, of course he meant something, right? He meant something. And he wants us to ask the question of why. Why would he divide his book into five sections? Is it found somewhere else in the Bible? Did anyone else you know of in the Bible divide his work into five sections? Oh, yeah, the Pentateuch, the five scrolls, right? Moses divided the five scrolls into five sections, and Matthew divides his book, and oh, I get what's going on. There's some kind of connection between what Matthew's writing and what Moses wrote, and he's intending us to see it. Um we're invited to see that Matthew is saying Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the super Moses. And you start saying, well, okay, show me some of that. Well, uh, in the Old Testament, a wicked king tries to kill God's redeemer, Moses. Right? The wicked king is the Pharaoh. Moses expounds the law on top of a mountain. Moses divides his work into five sections. Moses' culminating event is the Passover that frees people from slavery. And then Moses' book, the Pentateuch, the five scrolls, ends with hope for all the nations. That somehow... What's going on is going to end up with the entire world converted. And so we come to Matthew. Matthew's the only one who records the story that Herod tried uh, to kill uh, Jesus. Matthew's the only one who records the sermon where Jesus expounded the law on top of a mountain. Matthew divides his gospel into five sections. Matthew has the culminating event being the Passover when Jesus died, and Matthew ends his gospel with hope for the nations. So what Matthew is telling us is that when you come and read his gospel, that he means it to make the connection between uh, Moses and Jesus, that Jesus is the super Moses. And what he's picking up is a promise that Moses gives us, that God gives us through Moses. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. It is him you will listen to, just as you desired the Lord your God at Horeb. When you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, uh, lest I die, the Lord said, what they said is right. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the brothers. And when we get to the end of the Bible, we realize that that prophet like you is actually God himself incarnating in humanity. So the people said, if I have to hear God speak, I'll be overwhelmed. And so God said, well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to become a human being and I'm going to tell you what I want you to know. And so Matthew is saying, that's who we're saying Jesus is. Jesus is that promised prophet. Well, you might have heard someone say, uh, as I have often heard people say, well, aren't there obviously mistakes in genealogy, Jesus' genealogy? Aren't there problems with the numbers? Aren't there problems with the uh, the names listed down? Has anybody ever heard that? Uh, like um, with the Bible uh, and they say, well, you know, there's problems in the genealogy and there's problems with the numbers. Well, I, I would ask uh, the 
the critics maybe a candid question. Um, like, what did Matthew do for a living? Remind me, what, what was he? He was tar- So he dealt with lists of names and he dealt with numbers all day long? List of names and numbers and like there's a problem with a list of name or a number? Huh. Maybe I would give Matthew a benefit of the doubt. Um, maybe he knows something that we don't know. Um, but let's look at it. Uh, so if we were in a state university uh, uh, and we just had uh, um, a lecturer who was just going to uh, have a humanistic approach to the Bible, one of the lectures that we would hear is that Matthew's genealogy is wrong. It's wrong in the list of names and it's wrong in the numbers. Well, let's look at it. Let's see what it says. So this is the list uh, that Matthew gives. Um, This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Perez, Hezron, Ram, Aminadab, Nashon, Salmon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse. And then he goes to a second section. Jacob, um, well, uh, he, he does that section. And in the process, he starts his um, book with this phrase, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And that's going to be really important for us in a, a few minutes. And then notice that Matthew is kind of highlighting the not-so-great events in Israel's past. When uh, Judah and his brothers tried to kill Joseph. When uh, Judah ended up fathering uh, children by his own daughter-in-law, Tamar. When um, uh a woman who had been of scandalous background uh, was incorporated into the people of God, Rahab, who had formerly been a prostitute. And then Ruth, whose mother-in-law tried to get her to seduce Boaz, and Boaz wouldn't do it. And then King David, who fathered a child uh, with another man's wife. And so Matthew's starting out his genealogy, and he's not uh, backing away from some of the more embarrassing uh, passages in the Old Testament. Now, if we just uh, step back and look historically, uh, we would come across a tradition. It's actually um, in one of the fragments of Papias, that Eusebius, the early church historian, um, uh, includes for us. But there's a tradition uh, dating very early in the church. So Papias is like uh, 160, I think, and uh, Eusebius is writing 325, um, that says Matthew was originally composed in Hebrew or Aramaic and that it was written for the Jews. Now, we don't have any Hebrew manuscript of Matthew. Um, There are people who claim to have found uh, it. uh, One of those manuscripts is called Shem Tov, and um, when I went to uh, State University, uh, one of my professors is actually the person who published that uh, work and so I remember sitting in a Greek class and uh, hearing about Shem Tov and uh, the original Hebrew Matthew. We don't have it. We don't have that document, but w- it is interesting to see that Matthew is a very Jewish document. Uh, it's uh, supremely Jewish in its uh, approach. Uh, to what Jesus uh, did. And it starts with this phrase, Biblios Genesios 
Iesu Christu, book of the Genesis, or however you want to translate that, of Jesus Christ, which is really interesting in that in the Old Testament, that exact phrase is used of the heavens and the earth in Genesis 2 4. And it goes back to this thing that we were talking about, the Toledos. And you might say, well, what is a Toledoth? Well, uh, in Hebrew, um, Hebrew is a beautiful language. It's an elegant language. It's an old, 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 old language. Um, and it's really easy. Um, you can write all the grammar for Hebrew on the front of one notebook page and half the back. That's all there is to it. Uh, and then it's just memorizing words. Uh, you memorize words, really easy uh, grammar. And when you come to this word toledoth, it's related um, to this word, yalad. Uh, and everybody who's ever uh, learned um, Hebrew, when they try to memorize this word, everybody has the same mnemonic device, at least everybody I've ever met. When a woman has a baby, she yells, right? So yalad is a woman having a baby, right? A yelled is what a baby is called who's been born. And so, you, you know, that's how you remember it. And then this word toledoth is kind of the noun version of this have a baby word. And it's really weird in the Old Testament that you, you'll have stories that are outlined, and then their toledoth is given. And it, it, apparently the way it works is this is the facts, these are the facts, and then this is what happened as a result. This is the baby that those facts had. And so uh, in the Toledoth, this first one, um, we have uh, God's description of the creation of heavens and the earth. And then in 2.4, you have the Toledoth, and it's like, well, this is what that produced. This is the baby that that had. And in the Old Testament, that phrase occurs 13 times. These are the Toledoth, or the book of the Toledoth. Uh, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Noah, Shem, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Shem, Terah, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Esau's offspring, the Edomites, Jacob, Aaron, and Moses, Paris. Thirteen times it appears. Now, I don't know how, like, OCD you might be, um, but, like, is 13 a, like, a satisfying number, uh, like, in literature? Or do, don't you want there to be kind of like a 14 there? You know, it's like, um, well, that's, that's kind of how it works. In the Old Testament, you have 13. It's like, oh, come on, give me one more, you know. And it's just not there. You have 13 of these this is the baby that's born, and um, you have these names given. Weird thing about this list is there's some names that are omitted. When you see Adam, Noah, Shem, Terah, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Jacob, Aaron, Perez, are there any prominent people in the Old Testament who are omitted from that list? like in terms of major characters. David and kind of a big character in uh, Genesis, like half over half the books about him. Abraham. Okay, I got 13 Toledos, and like you're not even going to give David a Toledoth? Like is he really subsumed here and... You're not going to give Abraham a Toledoth? That's weird. Here's uh, that whole thing about giving birth and um, 
here's our word toledoth, and you can see all these words are going back to this word yalad, which is to have a baby. But why in the world do you omit the names, and why do you only have 13? Well, Matthew comes along and says, this is the toledoth of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Matthew, writing for Jews who love the Hebrew Old Testament, is saying, my book is the 14th Toledoth. My book brings the whole story. The whole Old Testament are the facts, and then this is what the facts produced, the baby that the facts brought forth. And so he divides his... Um, genealogy into three sections of 14. Uh, all the generations from Abraham to David were 14. All from David to the deportation of Babylon were 14. And uh, from the deportation of Babylon to uh, Jesus are 14. And you think, oh my goodness, like here's a guy who keeps lists of names and numbers and like he's found the elegance in the genealogies. He's found the reason for the details and the omission of the details. And then he says, the birth of Jesus happened this way. When his mother had been betrothed, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. In other words, you're, you're going to adopt him. He's going to be your legal heir, um, even though he's not your natural uh, uh, son. You will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so when we get these 14 generations and we're told, uh, sorry, I had this out of order a little bit, that his name is Jesus, we've already seen that this word Jesus is actually the word Joshua. And Matthew is saying Jesus is the real Joshua. He's not only the super Moses, he's the real Joshua. And his uh, birth is like this elegance and it's the 14th Toledoth and like he's the one who's bringing all the details uh, together. And Jesus said, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin and Jesus' name means Joshua and he's going to save his people from their sins. He's going to free us from uh, slavery. Um, and so we see in this story uh, all these things connecting Jesus. And Matthew points out that the virgin will conceive, and he's quoting this verse. We get um, uh, the word Parthenon, uh, which is uh, dedicated to the virgin Athena, or um, in biology, uh, the term Parthenogenesis, uh, virgin birth, uh, that's where we get the thing from this word, the virgin will conceive. And Matthew is saying that's bringing together the promise uh, from the Old Testament. It's uh, quoted in Isaiah 7, 14. And Jesus is bringing all that together. Uh, Matthew writing for Jews. Uh, Matthew being someone who keeps lists and numbers. He's saying the numbers in the list are, actually have a very elegant connection with Jesus, and Jesus is the promised one. And so when we look at Matthew, we can see symmetry and order in God's plan. We can see the uh, promise of a coming virgin-born Messiah. We can see the real-life failures of Old Testament characters, and we can see Matthew's uh, claim 
that the Old Testament is simply the backstory to the New Testament, and it's what makes uh, the New Testament make sense. He's writing for Jews. Uh, he's uh, helping them see that. And he's pointing out this elegance, uh, 14, 14, 14. Now, we've talked in this class a little bit about gematria. Who can remind me what gematria is? Right, it's where you use your alphabet as your number system. If you use your alphabet as your number system, what would that mean about every word in the language? There would be an inherent number. And would that be easy to see the number or hard to see the number? If you used your alphabet as your number system. It would be easy to see. You would see a number when you saw a word. And Jews practice gematria, and uh, Greeks pa practice gematria. And it's in the Bible. Probably the number of the beast is connected somehow to Nero. Um, Solomon's name number is connected with how many Proverbs. Hezekiah's name number is connected. And Jesus' name the gematria of Jesus' name is 888. And you think, oh, man's number is 666. You think, oh, there's some kind of like M. Night Shyamalan, clever, artistic uh, thing going on here. And you, if you concluded that, you'd be right because that's happening in the Bible. And you can get a list uh, of the alphabet with the, and you can uh, find any word. And if we did that for the word David, guess what the gematria of David's name is? So the Hebrew alphabet goes Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, He, uh, Vav. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So if you wanted to figure out what the numeric value of that word was, it would be 4 and 6 and 4 again. So what would the gematria of David's name be? 14. And you, you start looking at Matthew and say, oh, that's clever. You've got a David from Abraham to David, and you've got a David from David to the Babylonian captivity, and you've got a David from the Babylonian captivity to Jesus. And you think, oh, and it happens to be the 14th Toledoth in the whole Bible. And you think, oh, like, that's almost like God had, like, planned this out or something that's clever. And it is clever. It's really clever. And God is always doing that. He's saying this happened to the very day. Like, God gets kind of that overall arching meta narrative plot symmetrical elegant thing and he does it all through the bible and he's doing that with this he's all kind of details are coming together and it's a very beautiful elegant genealogy but if we were in a state school someone would say Wait a second. Matthew cheated. Because if you go through the text, there aren't 14 names in the second group. These three are omitted. And these are omitted. And so he said there are 14, but actually... Uh, there are 20, and uh, he counted the Babylonian captivity. Uh, there are only 13. Like Matthew, you can't count, and you haven't read your uh, Hebrew Old Testament. I don't know. Should we just give up? Like, I, I know, we, you know, 
it says like we believe in inerrancy and like uh, someone says, well, Matthew cheated. Should we just give up and say, okay, you win? Or should we look at why he omitted the names? I don't know. I'm in for a good fight, you know? Like, let's see. Let's dance. Let's see where it goes, right? Is there a reason those names are omitted? Well, I know this guy wasn't made king by God. The mob made him king. And this guy wasn't made king by the mob. Pharaoh Necho made him king. And this guy wasn't made king by God. Nebuchadnezzar made him king. So if Matthew is giving legitimate kings, there's a reason why these names aren't there. He's actually right. Matthew's right. Those aren't in the list. We say, well, what about these guys? I mean, that guy is one of the best kings ever lived. Uh, the child king and uh, all that. Well, wh what about him? I'll never forget when I was first wrestling with this. I went to uh, uh, get some help from other people and a lot of people said, oh, well, numbers aren't important, just omit it. I've never really been satisfied with that. So I went to some people I trusted. And finally, I went to the ancient church father, Chrysostom. Chrysostom preached through the whole Bible. And uh, people would get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and listen to him for an hour before they went to work every day of the week. Can you imagine a preacher that good? Chrysostom isn't his name, that's his nickname, and it comes from chrysos, which means gold. And then anybody in biology know what the word stoma means? Uh, means mouth. Uh, so it's where we get stomach from, you know. Uh, so what does Chrysostom mean? John the Golden Mouth? How would you like that as a nickname if you were a preacher? Well, who are you? You, I am John Chrysostom, <laughs> like the Golden Mouth. So I went to the Golden Mouth to get some help. And you know what he said about this passage? He said, the answer to this question is so obvious that if I have to tell you, it will make you lazy. And I don't want you to be lazy Bible readers, so I'm not going to tell you the answer. And boom, he went on to the next verse. And it kind of made me mad because I thought, well, I'm not lazy. I really want to know, but I, it doesn't seem that obvious to me. Could it be the fact that Ahaz's mother was Ahab's wife and Ahab is under a curse to the fourth generation? Is that why maybe Matthew's not counting these as legitimate kings? The text does say that. And you say, well, what about this Babylonian captivity? It's either counting the Babylonian captivity or it's counting this guy twice. I think it's counting this guy twice because he is released midway in the Babylonian captivity. And I don't, I don't know whether Matthew's counting the Babylonian captivity as one or counting this guy twice. I think you can make the argument both ways. But I know this, for a guy who makes his living reading list and could volume read ancient Hebrew, I'm not going to bet against him. If he says these are the legitimate ones, they're the legitimate ones. And my uh, job is not to try to prove him wrong. My job is to try, try to think his thoughts after him. And it seemed to me that uh, he is right with this elegance. Um, and here's the passage that talks about the curse of Ahab um, uh, and the, uh, or Ahaziah's father. Um, uh, it says the daughter of Ahab was his wife uh, the text says God brings a curse to the third and fourth generation. 
but then particularly that Ahab's line is cursed. The whole house of Ahab shall perish. I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free. Uh, I'll put him under a curse. So I wonder if that's why those three uh, aren't counted, but let's all take the chiding of Chrysostom and Bebereans and go look for ourselves and to see. Well, what about Matthew's genealogy versus Luke's genealogy? Um, Matthew has, uh, what is that, 42 people. Luke has a lot more than uh, 42, and they're different. And they are different. If you go write them down, uh, this is going to be Matthew's, and apparently he's taking it down to uh, Joseph. But then he's pointing out that Joseph isn't his real father, just his adopted father. And Mary, this makes Jesus of the house of David. But then Luke says, well, actually Mary was from David too. And Mary comes from Nathan, Solomon's brother. And there were more generations in this. So they're giving uh, two genealogies, but there's a reason. Um, one is Matthew, uh, one is Joseph's genealogy, and one is Mary's genealogy. Now, before we go on, uh, questions or follow-up or observations about any of that? Maybe it's more than you ever wanted to know about gematria and genealogies. Um, but the, the, the point of that, I think, is the data is our friend. Uh, when there's an accusation, the data is our friend. Go look at the data. It, I think it's because um, a humanist approach to the Bible has always been fostered with what's called a hermeneutic of suspicion. That is, you should assume the Bible isn't true and then look for places where it isn't true. Um, and that's the wrong way to approach the Bible. Um, it's not the way you would approach someone you trusted. Um, when you come to a confusing thing, your mind doesn't first go to the problem, you start thinking, well, is there a possible solution? And the, I think the Bible invites us to reject a hermeneutics of suspicion, my, myself. But um, Any other uh, comments or follow-ups? Well, what about this one, the virgin will conceive? Uh, how many of you have ever heard that the text really doesn't say uh, the virgin, it really says the young woman. How many have ever heard that? Uh, well, maybe, maybe I. This is a swing and a miss. Uh, maybe I'm doing questions that people ask me, and I should rethink these. But a lot of people will say Matthew is misunderstanding the uh, quote in the Old Testament that it isn't the virgin; it's the young woman. And people who say that are right in that the normal word virgin in the Bible is the word betula. And this word is not the word betula, it's the word alma. The alma uh, will uh, conceive and bear a son. And all of these definitions are given to the word alma. A, marriage, a girl of marriageable age, a young woman, uh, even uh, this dictionary says a youthful spouse recently married. And so uh, <clears throat> people will say Isaiah says nothing about a virgin conceiving. Rather, it speaks of a young woman conceiving. And so when Matthew says scripture 
says a virgin will conceive, he's actually overreading the text, which would be a, a fairly big accusation. Uh, people would be saying that Christianity got uh, off on the wrong foot because it's claiming uh, a virgin birth when um, there's nothing in the Old Testament that points that way. Well, I think if Matthew were here, he would say, well, wait a minute. Um, let's actually look at that word Alma because Alma comes from this word, Alam, um, and this word is related to the word hidden or to hide oneself or to be concealed. And so many people are saying that this actually is more of a virgin word because it's talking about a girl who's never even been looked at, um, someone who's been hidden. So let's look at this argument. Um, in Har I think Matthew would say this, the virgin will conceive in Isaiah harkens back to the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman uh, will crush the serpent's head. And uh, some people translate the text, a virgin will conceive. And for the life of me, I don't know why they do it because in Hebrew and in Greek, it says the virgin will conceive. So who is the virgin? Uh, and you could make the case that it's the one promised in Genesis 3.15. Uh, I will put uh, enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, so there's a seed of the serpent, <coughs> and her seed, there's the seed of the woman. He will bruise you on the head, you will bruise him on the heel. Um and our text in Isaiah 7, the Lord says, the Lord himself will give you a sign, the Alma, the hidden one or the hidden virgin, will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, whenever you want to understand something in the Bible, Go read the stuff around it. Like, if if you come to a chapter and you're kind of confused, read the one before it and the one after it. And a lot of times it will become crystal clear. So, in Isaiah 6, that's where um, Isaiah sees the Lord in the temple and he says, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in a people of unclean lips. God forgives his sin and then he gives him a commission. Uh, who will go? And Isaiah says, I will go. And I dare say many of us have heard sermons up to that point. Usually it's like a mission conference. Who will go? Here I am, send me. We never look at the rest of the chapter because the rest of the chapter says, God says to Isaiah, uh, do this. I want you to preach in a way where they don't get it. I, I want you to preach in a way where they can hear the words but not like have the aha moment. And Isaiah says, well, how long should I do that? And uh, the Lord says, do it through two exiles. That's a very strange thing. Why would the Lord say, Preach in a way where they don't get it. And then we have chapter 7. This is shortly after that call. Uh, and this is what it says. In the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, king of Samaria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but they could not mount an attack. Uh, Jerusalem sits on top of a mountain. It's very hard to attack. They couldn't win. 
the king was freaked out about this attack. And so the Lord said to Isaiah, go out and meet Ahaz, you and uh, your son, Sher Joshub. Now, I don't know, uh, like, how many people hope to get married one day? Uh, how many of you hope to have children one day? Do you have a list of names? Okay, is Sher Joshub going to make the list? As intelligent readers, what's the question we always ask when a name's given in Scripture? What does it mean? And this name means a remnant will return. There's going to be an exile and a remnant will return. And God just said there's going to be two exiles. This is the only time I know in Scripture where God says, take your little baby with you. You and your son, a remnant will return, and go stand at the end of the conduit in the upper pool on the highway to the washerman's field. Does that sound like precise to you? Like God says, okay, I want you to go stand by the clock in the triangle and make sure you're there at 857.18. It's like, okay, why? Why would God tell to take him son? Why would he tell him to stand at a particular place? And how does that relate to preaching away so that they don't get it? Well, this highway on the washerman's field, can you see these words are all the same words? And they're these verses. All three of them are these verses. What this place is, is the place where 40 years in the future, there's going to be a king who's going to come and curse the Lord. And he's going to say, and don't let uh, Hezekiah tell you that the Lord's going to deliver you because we've destroyed other kingdoms. We're going to destroy your kingdom. And Hezekiah, in this beautiful moment of wisdom, um, took the letter, the cursing letter, and just laid it out in front of the Lord in the temple and said, this guy says you're not strong enough to defend us. There are 185,000 men surrounding and they're going to come in here and kill us. And this guy said, you're not any different than an idol. And this guy says, there's nothing you can do about it. And so the text in all of these places says that God sent one angel. Sent one angel. And that one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. The Hebrew text is kind of funny because it says, uh, and they woke up in the morning and they were dead. Like, is that a bad day? Like your alarm goes off and you think, oh, I've, I'm dead. Oh, <laughs> I wish I'd done my homework, you know, or maybe I don't care, you know. It's like you wake up dead. It's going to pretty much be downhill from there. And like God sent one soldier and killed 185,000. And it was at this place. This place is where it happened. So God is saying, take your little child who is a remnant will return and talk to Ahaz. And the Lord says, listen, O house of David, is it too slight for you think to try the patience of men that you try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. Behold, and why in the world they translate it a virgin, I mean, we're going to look at the text. It doesn't say a virgin, it says the virgin, uh, will conceive and bear a son, and uh, she will call his name Emmanuel. Um, so here's the NLT, and notice they 
get it right, the virgin will conceive. This is the text. This is the word Alma, the hidden one. And this is the word the. The Alma will conceive and she is bearing a son. And you woman will call his name with us as God. So here's what happens. Um, Isaiah is holding his old boy. A remnant will return. He's standing in the place where 40 years in the future, God's going to send a soldier and kill 185,000 people. And he asks uh, Ahaz to ask for a sign from God. And Ahaz says, oh, I never. And he says, God's going to give you a sign. The Alma will conceive and bear a son and you're going to call his name God with us. So seven ends, Isaiah goes home and sleeps with his wife, and she gets pregnant. And they name that kid Mahar Sha'al Hashbaz. You got your list, you might want to write. You call Mahar for short, short maybe. Uh, it means speedy is the booty, swift is the prey. So God says, here's the sign. Here's the like sign that's higher than heaven, that's deeper than Sheol. The Alma will conceive and bear a son. Isaiah goes home and sleeps with his wife. She gets pregnant and uh, she has a, a baby. Is that fulfillment of this passage? What is Isaiah holding in his arms? His son. Do you want to make a guess on the virginal status of the woman Isaiah is married to? So I'm just going to go way out on a limb and thinking that she's not this hidden woman that's being talked about. And they don't name that kid Emmanuel. They name him Maharsha al Hashbaz. Preach in a way where they don't get it. Preach in a way where it should be obvious what you're saying, but they're. So let's, let's say that it means the young woman. You're talking about a sign that's higher than heaven and deeper than Sheol. And it's that a young woman's going to get pregnant and have a baby. Oh my goodness, that's never happened before. Like, who would have ever thought that a young woman get pregnant and have a baby? Oh wow, I can see how that's higher than heaven, deeper than Sheol. Because like, that's just happened a gazillion times in history. Right? What hasn't happened a gazillion times in history? A virgin. What's going on? Preach in a way where they don't get it. Well, let's look. We've heard that this word Alma just means young woman. So this is a passage where it um, occurs. This is a first use. It's used all of these times in Scripture. This is Abraham's servant. Behold, I am standing by a spring of water. Let the Alma who comes out to draw water, to whom I say, please give me a little water from your... Let her be the one that Isaac's going to marry. Does it mean virgin there, or just does it mean a youngish woman? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, uh, Go, so the Alma went and called the child's mother. Um, this is Miriam. I think she's nine years old. Chronicles, this is just a name, uh, 
according to the Alamot, um, uh, this is according to the Alamot again. Um, this is according to uh, the Alamot. This one is the one that many people say proves that it's not virgin. Three things are too wonderful for me. Four I do not understand. A way of the eagle in the sky. The way of a serpent on a rock. The way of a ship on the high seas. And the way of a geber, a warrior man, with an alma. And so many people say, well, that clearly is non-virgin there. But couldn't that be talking about the first time or uh, when a man and a woman are about to come together? Because the guy who wrote that was married to 600 women or 700 women and he had 300 mistresses. I don't think that was much of a mystery to him. I do think what is a mystery to him was the unusual way two people interact as they're about to come together. I think this one is virgin too. Clearly this one is virgin. Um, there are, um, well, this one has to be virgin. There are 60 queens, 80 mistresses, and almas without number. Clearly that one has to be virgin. And then we come to this, the virgin will conceive. It's not much of a sign if it's just a young woman. And God is talking about a sign that's higher than heaven. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the Alma will conceive and you'll call his name with us. Emanu is God. God is with us. We've seen the problem that some people want to translate that young woman and imply that it's not a virgin. I don't, I don't think that's true. Um, so uh, questions or comments uh, uh, before we uh, close out? If we do it that way, um, it explains why the place and how it's a sign and how it's a major sign because this is not about Isaiah's child. It's about the child that's going to come after the second exile. Um, and clearly, uh, the New Testament is translating it virgin and the Septuagint, the Greek translation, uh, is translating virgin. And even Isaiah himself talks about a remnant will return. And what's that kid's name? What's that kid's name that Isaiah is holding? A remnant will return. Will return to El Gibor, God Almighty. And this, the child that's going to be born... This is going to be his name, uh, Wonderful Counselor, El Gibor, the warrior god, uh, the Shar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, the Aviade, the Father of Eternity. And when that child comes, the lion will lay down with the lamb. This is like Eden is being restored. Uh, and of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. None of those things are true of Hezekiah. None of them are true of Mahar Shaul Hashbaz. They're all true uh, of Jesus. Um, and I love in 
Hebrew, it says, On that day we will give thanks to you, O Lord. You were angry with me. You uh, turned your anger away. Behold, God is my salvation. Can I just read that out loud in Hebrew, what that says? Behold, El, and then I'm just going to read the word out loud. You tell me if you find anything significant. Behold, El is my Yeshuati. God is my Yeshua. Have you heard that word somewhere else in the Bible? Oh, oh yeah, like God becoming. Oh yeah, like comfort, comfort my people. The Lord you seek will certainly appear. So, oh my goodness, this is a whole Bible, biblical theology, and Matthew picked up on it. And Matthew's right, not his modern uh, critics. Well, that's what I have for you this morning. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'll see you on Thursday.